Well, good afternoon. Um, this, uh, owing to what I think people understand as, as, as perhaps the inevitable impact on person, there are a number of uh, philosophical and religious issues attendant to how we go forward in synthetic biology. And uh, this session is to try to begin to address some of those head on, inviting, uh, inviting our experts to uh, uh, share with us. And again, we'll c cover the same format. Uh, we will use time following your three presentations for the panel and also members of the audience to address some, uh, address some questions. So let me introduce uh, to our commission and to the audience are three experts for this particular panel. Art Kaplan, Arthur Kaplan is Emanuel and Robert Hart, Director of the Center for Bioethics. Sidney D. Kaplan, Professor of Bioethics here at Penn. He is the author of over 30 books. Uh, relevant ones uh, he offers include books with titles such as Smart Mice But Not So Smart People and The Penn Guide to Bioethics. He has served on a number of national and international committees, uh, is the recipient of numerous awards and honorary degrees, writes a regular column for under uh, msnbc.com. And Dr. Kaplan, we're pleased to have you here. Let me go ahead and just run down the, run down the list. Um, Dr. Ingrid Matson, director of the McDonald Center for the Study of Islam and Christian Muslim Relations and Director of Islamic Chaplaincy at Hartford Seminary in Hartford, Connecticut. She's the President also of the Islamic Society of North America. Dr. Matson is the first female and first convert to Islam to lead the Islamic Society of North America. Her research is, uh, focuses on Islamic law and society, and she's recognized internationally, uh, has spoken uh, for example, on human dignity at the World Economic Forum annual meeting that was held in Davos in 2007. So welcome, Dr. Matson. We're very happy to have you join us. And then Sandra Eli, uh, or is it Eli? I apologize. Sandra Wheeler, she's <laughs> Sandra Eli Wheeler, uh, teaches uh, theological and social ethics at Duquesne, where she specializes in bioethics for healthcare professionals and at Wesley Theological Seminary, where she is the Martha Ashby Carr Professor of Christian Ethics. She also works with the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the NIH Human Genome Initiative on programs related to social, ethical, and religious aspects of genetic technology. Her particular interest uh, is in the interface between questions of biomedical ethics and central commitments of Jewish and Christian faith, and to you. Thank you also for being here. Why don't, uh, Art, why don't we ask you to kick off the... Uh, presentations today. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Madam Chair, for allowing me to uh, share some of my thinking about the religious, philosophical, and spiritual significance of synthetic biology with you and the members of the commission. I uh, wrote out my testimony, and uh, it's there. Um, it's about 20 single-space pages. So like Fidel Castro, I will presumed to be done in about four hours, but in the interest of uh, conciseness and having dialogue, I'm not going to read all of that. I'll read parts of it. Uh, you may take a look at it later. I don't think you should try to follow. You'll get lost. So I'm going to jump around from it a little bit. I think, uh, you know, most of the ethical commentary and religious commentary concerning synthetic biology is centered around the risks that might come with the benefits. I think the benefits uh, case is strong. We heard some about it this morning. Um, All I right, think let me just, can you hear in the back? Fine, everyone can hear? Okay, good, good. I think the uh, safety issues uh, to public health and to the environment are ones that will occupy you, but I hope in this, uh, these remarks to convince you too that it would be useful as part of your recommendations to attend to some of the philosophical and spiritual themes that I think uh, advances in th synthetic biology raise. Um, if you look at uh, what the religious community has said, and I know you've heard already in an earlier meeting uh, from people like Paul Wolpe, um, there are uh, some groups that have been looking at synthetic biology for some time. Penn had a group way back in 1998 take a look at uh, some of the ethical issues around synthetic biology. We invited many uh, figures from uh, religious traditions to participate. 
Catholic, conservative and liberal Protestants, Buddhists, conservative Judaism were there. And uh, they had no in principle objection at that time to the creation of new life forms. Their concerns then were primarily about the impact of synthetic organisms on the environment, safety, and with social justice, who could uh, get the benefits in an equitable way that might flow from synthetic biology. I don't think that much has changed since that time. I don't think there are that many theologians uh, who are particularly uh, cognizant or conversant with synthetic biology quite yet. I think more are becoming interested. But I think those same issues about uh, safety and uh, fair distribution of benefits, fair distribution of risk remain strong. And I noticed uh, this week there were some polls out that said uh, the public had pretty much the same uh, reaction to uh, synthetic biology, worrying about safety and also uh, concerned about whether these life forms might uh, stay where they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say just a word first about some of the things I think this commission might consider in terms of trying to ensure safety. I'm going to do that and uh, not going to spend a lot of time in these remarks beating up on the precautionary principle, which you've heard about. But the precautionary principle, which is used in some parts of the world, holds that it, the burden of proof is on those who would advance a technology to make the case that it is safe. And then depending on how safe you want it to be, you have a low bar or a high bar to jump over in advancing a technology. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's the right uh, strategy for this group or this country to follow with synthetic biology. I think the case should be made in a mutual way between policymakers, scientists, and the public about what they want to see happen in terms of managing the safety issue. But I do think there are a number of steps that can be taken to uh, ensure confidence that this technology as it advances uh, is safe. Um, we are talking about this against a backdrop where we've had uh, failures in controlling the dissemination of organisms, and I don't have to remind this group about the problems we've had with uh, things getting into places we don't want them, whether they're kudzu or Japanese beetles or starlings, or for that matter, zebra mussels and little beetles. We have a track record at sometimes of people promising that no nothing's going anywhere and then the fire ants are in your backyard or the killer bees are buzzing around your head. Similarly, we've seen challenges, and the public is aware of these, of uh, GMO escaping uh, genetically modified seeds, going places that people don't want them. Um, I think some of what the commission has to wrestle with then can be generalized to other technologies, even the control of new species, the control of genetically modified foods. And so the question becomes, well, what standard of control, if you're not going to use a high bar precautionary principle, might we be thinking about? I'm going to say that I think the first uh, requirement in looking at uh, uh, how to manage this is the presumption that there may be people who have uh, ill will or nefarious purposes uh, who might want to use the technology. And in an age of bioterror, um, it is uh, important that the commission remember that not just the people we mm -hmm. saw this morning uh, might want to put their hands on synthetic biology, but others might as well. So one way that things get where they're not supposed to is if somebody puts them there who has a malicious intent. The other way is by accident and inadvertence. I don't think anybody's going to just put uh, synthetic biology uh, to use to make microbes or combined entities uh, that they wish uh, to go willy-nilly all over the place. So I think we're talking uh, trying to minimize accident, error, uh, and inadvertence uh, so those are what I see as the sources of safety challenge. So let me suggest then that this commission, just on where we are now for safety purposes, and then I'll get to the spiritual themes, might consider some of the following points, some general suggestions. First, I think national security and public health do deserve top ethical priority. So you may consider what controls, if any, ought to be put on the publication of scientific materials, the selection of locations of laboratories to make things initially, and who's permitted to go there to train in the techniques, who can learn to make these things. Um, I think that uh, uh, we have some precedent in areas like GMO where people have tried to grow 
seeds in controlled environments and pressures come from commercial sources or sometimes local government to let the technology be used in less controlled environments. That sort of back and forth, I think, becomes important in understanding the need for site selection, who's training, who's publishing, and what they're saying. I'm not calling it for censorship per se, but I think it is important that you reflect upon what's said and uh, who might need whatever clearance they might need to look at certain things. In an age when the polio genome is up on the web and the smallpox genome is up on the web, um, it may not be uh, advisable to have every synthetic organism possible up on the web in terms of its uh, genetic code. Secondly, in order to ensure the responsible handling of things made by synthetic biology, I would argue that synthetic organisms ought always to be marked or branded. It's the old 19th century cattle idea. Uh, Venter's team did it when they made their creature. You heard this morning a little bit about the possibility, which isn't that hard, to brand life forms. Watermarks or brands uh, certainly give people accountability and they let you trace better. And if you take uh, branding and traceability as a key part of uh, uh, trying to ensure the public that safety is being pursued, I think that could go a long way toward uh, uh, making pe people feel more confident that we know if something made by synthetic biology wound up somewhere we didn't want it. Thirdly, uh, to ensure the safety of the environment from accidents, I do agree, and this was brought up already today, that every synthetic life form should have a limit on its lifespan, at least for now. We can maybe revisit that someday, but it would be nice if uh, some sort of terminator gene or other technology were built in to control uh, organisms to make sure that the synthetic ones are relatively fragile at the beginning of the technology. Um, lastly, I think a single agency should have clear-cut responsibility for the release of entities created by synthetic biology outside the lab. I think it is important that the committee reassert that existing regs do apply to synthetic biology broadly defined. I don't want to get into the definitions here. And I think some notion even of audit might be considered when the EPA sends its letter to Amy saying, we're on the ball here. I'd kind of like to know that they're on the ball, on boots on the ground, not just in Washington thinking hard about it. Mm -hmm. So it does seem to me that having agency responsibility in the American context, I don't have much to say about how to coordinate that internationally, but at least here, um, making sure that they know what they're responsible for and that they're going to check periodically to make sure there is compliance think those kinds of ideas may help tamp down some of those safety concerns. I think the benefits, again, are worth absolutely worth pursuing of synthetic biology, both medically, industrially, uh, in many areas of life. But I think the safety issues should not uh, prove to be uh, uh, obstacles that can't be managed, but it's going to take a little bit of serious effort to look at both what might bad guys do and then what might happen by, as I said, accidents or inadvertence or mistakes, and maybe some of the ideas I gave would help. So let me then get away from that. I think that's where the religious community has been thinking, the public's been thinking, but I want to stir up, as I get to the end of these remarks, the um, uh, spiritual themes that I think are interesting. And these, for me, fall into three categories. The first is playing God, which you've been dragged around a little bit already, but I'm going to drag you there again because I think it's important. The second is what I would call the end of the view that life is special or life's exceptionalism, you might say. And the third is worries about the mixture or placement of genomes across species, which we actually heard a smidgen about this, this morning as well. As uh, was pointed out, some of these things are in some of the reflections and the readings in your book. The Swiss have paid a little attention to them. There's a tendency in policy circles in Washington to do the risk-benefit and move on. I would suggest to you whether it's animal chimeras, embryonic stem cell research, or cloning, none of those things have been addressed only by risk-benefit analysis. What bothers the public and what might bother the religious community could include some of what I'm calling these spiritual themes. So the possibility that humans can create life, I think, has been a cultural worry in our society and in other societies for a long time. 
I don't expect anybody to make a living person from scratch in a Frankenstein fashion anytime soon, but I do expect everybody who's a critic of this technology to be talking about Frankenberry, uh, Franken bacteria pretty fast. Um, I think the key admonition about playing God, as I understand that argument, is that it's not about the divinity per se, but it's about first the notion of playing. I mean, it's, we tend to say, oh, playing God, it's the God part that people are worried about. I think they're equally worried about the playing part. Playing brings to mind carefree, lighthearted, even irresponsible activity, not the sort of thing that lends confidence to those who might be involved in making new life forms or new combinations of genomes or genome transfers. So I think cautions about playing God are trying to use the notion of play to suggest that scientists are at best cavalier, and at worst they're just screwing around out there uh, when it comes to making artificial novel life forms. I think the criticism is unfair. Those involved in the creation of synthetic new life forms are not doing it as a game, but in the hope that they can better understand how life works and in the future make microbes that can benefit us all. So I would maintain that play is not much in evidence in the motivation for, or just as importantly, the funding of synthetic biology. But I think that message needs to come across from you. The other part of it is the analogy to the divinity, and there I would say, as I understand the playing God criticism, it's a warning about arrogance, that don't think you can do what a God can do. It's hubristic to think you can control everything. I agree it's not clear that we can completely control everything, and we've had our problems with life forms in the past. I would concede that. Surely it will be prudent to create mechanisms for identifying and tracing and causing uh, the natural death of life forms that might get out and for ensuring their fragility, as I said. So in order to heed warnings about arrogance, I think we need to be certain that we can do our best in controlling the, where novel life forms go, but also who can use them and under what circumstances. So I take the warning about arrogance very seriously take the warning not to play very seriously. I think those are themes that have to be addressed as people say, is this technology uh, really receiving the attention, both policy and regulatory it merits? On the exceptionalism front, um, let me simply say that there's just a long tradition in science of trying to argue that life is special and that you can't explain it mechanistically. Uh, it goes through people like Henri Bergson, goes through people like Hans Driesch, um, Swan and Pasteur were all exponents of Entelecki's vital forces. Uh, it was biology's version of the soul for a long time. You had to have something animating uh, things to make the inorganic come alive. Um, I know that materialistic reductionism dominates biological th thinking today. There are no life exceptionalists in the foxholes of the NIH. I'm well aware of that. They don't get grants. If you sit around and say, ooh, there's something magical about life and I'm going to study that through my grant proposal, <clears throat> you'll get a low score. That all said, um, the mystery of life linked to this notion of a special metaphysical notion that life is emergent or does have some special uh, metaphysical uh, force that animates things when they're alive, I think is challenged by synthetic biology. I think it's challenged sometimes by people like Craig Venter with glee, uh, saying, look, it is just reductionism. We can explain everything mechanically. There's nothing special here. Learning to live in a world where life has been shown by science to be the product of material forces subject to human control, I think could prove disturbing to some with religious, theological, or spiritual backgrounds. My comment here is that the commission may consider trying to urge people to understand that understanding the nature of life mechanistically can also be a source of wonder and even of awe. You can see that in the descriptions of a Stephen Hawking about cosmology and many physicists as they try to understand uh, the workings of the natural world. It isn't just disrespectful and it isn't just demeaning. It can be, in fact, quite exciting. Last comment, I think that... Uh, some of what we're going to see in synthetic biology uh, is going to involve moving products into people. Uh, there's some work being done and some thought being given to things like taking a genome of a bacteria and putting it in the human eye and using that as a shortcut to try and boost vision in people who have genetic errors or degeneration in cells in their eyes. Um, we heard some about using different microbes to clean out arteries full of cholesterol or to achieve immunization. When we mix species, 
that gives some people pause. And I think alienness or otherness, the notion of our purity being uh, invaded by species transfer, even synthetically created uh, entities, does uh, leave some people a little bit nervous. And I think we have to attend to that as well. My notion for attending to it is to try and make people understand that much of what they do as they eat and interact with the world also involves interactions with all manner of genomes and genetic material. It's not quite as alien as we think. It's just part of how things go, but it happens at such a small level we don't notice it. So in conclusion, let me just say, I think there are things that can be done to meet the general and common concern in the religious community, but in the public, about safety. I think they have to acknowledge both uh, deliberate and careful use of synthetic biology, accident, and even uh, ill purposes. The other spiritual themes I've tried to raise, I urge you not to let them get lost. They should be a part of what you deliberate about, because I think they, too, are things that uh, drive and uh, uh, shape how legislators and the public are going to see synthetic biology. Arthur, thank you very much for that thoughtful, uh, thoughtfully prepared, delivered message. Dr. Matson. Yes, thank you. Uh, let me begin by saying that um, uh, from my research into um, how the Muslim community globally has been looking at some of these bioethical issues, I don't see that um, the issues raised by synthetic bi biology are particularly different in kind of those raised with the um, development of gen genetic technologies. However, and, and this is going to shape my presentation to you today, what I notice is that there is a gap between the theologians and the ethicists from our religious traditions and ordinary people. Um, and I think that's something you're going to have to be mindful of. I can sit here, we could sit here and give you the... Um, you know, the views of the official or the authorized theologians from our tradition and not give you a sense of what the majority of the religious community is thinking. Um, that has to do with the fact that they are looking to many other sources um, for their information about these issues. I can only um, give you as an example the fact that in my community there's been an alarming rise in the last 10 years of a new, uh, very superficial kind of creationism when previously uh, um, the, the Muslim community historically was, was very pro-science um, and pro-empirical in science. But a, a particular sort of group of people um, adopted uh, mostly American, um, uh, conservative sort of superficial creationist doctrines, translated them into uh, uh, sort of Islamic terminology and have been propagating this globally. I mean, I, I go to, I've, I've gone to Malaysia, I've gone to Turkey, I've seen it in the United States where these same very, you know, mistaken doctrines have been translated. So I'm concerned about, about um, scientific education and the role of the of uh, the religious community in um, making sure that there isn't a, 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 an increasing gap between what the theologians of our community and ordinary people uh, are doing. And I think what I'd like to say is that I, I think part of the reason for the um, adoption of these, what I believe scientifically mistaken views are, one, one explanation is a broader social trend towards a, um, you mentioned, and, and I think, Arthur, in your paper, reification, or in one of the papers is talk about reification of nature from a secular perspective, um, a kind of simplistic or naive I idea of getting back to nature. Um, and that's something that, that has, has some parts of the religious community have adopted. Um, certainly there's a perennialist or anti-modernist um, tendency among all of the Abrahamic religions, it's it's minor, but it because it's uh, conflating with a kind of secular environmentalism or a certain kind of secular environmentalism, it seems to be gaining some strength, um, in my opinion. Um, and to sort of 
maybe bring us back to a way we, we can approach it. I just like to, I, I think this is a very interesting um, uh, story that goes back to the origin of, of Islam, where, where the Prophet Muhammad, who himself was from a, um, was from a community that was primarily involved in, in trading of goods and uh, uh, nomadic camel trading, moved to a um, agricultural community. And there, uh, one day, he passed by some people who were in the uh, date palm orchard. And he saw that uh, there were some people on the top of the trees. He asked what they were doing. And people told him they're pollinating the trees by bringing the male parts in contact with the female parts. And he said, well, I don't think that's going to do any good. And so that was relayed to the people who were doing it, and they stopped doing it. And then, and then he said, the Prophet Muhammad said, well, why did they stop doing it? And they said, because you said you didn't think it would do any good. He said, no, no, that's just, I'm just saying, expressing a feeling. If they think there's a benefit in doing it, then they should go ahead and do it. So this cross-pollinization. But what, there's a number of interesting aspects to the story, in my opinion. First, the kind of visceral reaction um, when you face something that's new, particularly when it has to do with life, something that seems to be unnatural, um, the kind of engineering of life. I think this is a universal um, reaction that will continue with us and that we need to educate people about. This is, a, this is maybe a natural reaction to the feeling that something is, is unnatural. Um, so to kind of recognize that feeling and then be educated about the fact that, I mean, as long as we have human history, whether it's uh, date palms or dogs, we've been, you know, engaging in this uh, cross-pollinization and exchange of genetic material, engineering this uh, forever. Um, but the other thing is that the issue of benefit. So the, the Muslim jurists have always said, well, you know, here the lesson is that if people think there's a benefit in it, they should do it. This is not, you know, a religious issue unless it, uh, there's a specific violation of, um, uh, of religious principles. But here I would say really is the major concern of, of the Muslim community globally because it is a community that in, to a large extent lives in non-democratic countries, authoritarian countries, countries that have experienced... Um, the corruption of governments through, you know, multinational corporations like oil and gas companies, so that they've benefited neither economically nor politically. They've had env environmental damage. And there's a great fear that another technology that has such power will simply continue that, that tendency. So from my reading, this is the major concern is the concern about justice. And, you know, this idea um, about playing God, you know, there's an interesting story in the Quran about a dialogue between Moses and Pharaoh. And um, uh, Moses, tr trying to bring Pharaoh down, you know, put him in his place, says, well, it's God who, who creates life and death. And Pharaoh says, well, I, I bring people to life and put them to death. Look, and he, you know, he sends someone to his death. And, uh, and so the idea of oppression of using, using this, of play, it's not playing God, but of becoming the, the oppressor, using uh, this as, um, as an oppressive tool. But then Moses says, well, can you bring the sun from the west? Mm -hmm. So one of the sort of the metaphysical or the spiritual response is that God's power, creative power, is far beyond creating life or taking life. Um, there's a whole big universe uh, under which all of this occurs that... Um, that we don't have control over. And so we're not that threatened uh, spiritually by, by this power. But for sure, the, the, the concern about who is going to decide the, the benefit is, is, a, is a significant one. Um, the, uh, the issue of, of life, whether um, life itself is, is unique, um, whether God's creative power of life is something that that humans should should um, restrain from from imitating is an interesting question and I, I'm actually quite curious about the fact that that uh, Islam has been iconoclastic through its history now the main reason is that um, uh, Muslim theologians felt that there should not be any intermediary between a person 
and God in, in their supplications and prayers. So that the use of icons uh, um, in worship is prohibited. Yet at the same time, there was a, what developed was a generally widespread prohibition on um, representative images at all. Mm-hmm. So that um, statuary, representative paintings are something that are only in a ve- have a very very minor um, part of, of Muslim society and is not considered to be the majority position. Now I have not seen at all in in any of my research any link between the idea of creating life and the fear that if you would make a statue that somehow you're imitating God. I'm not quite sure if I'm I should be sort of making this link for people, but I'm, I'm sure that, that there is, there will be um, some at least underlying concern that uh, the more that people have the ability, that scientists have the ability to really, you know, create life, that there is a kind of arrogance, um, um, spiritual arrogance in trying to imitate the creative power of God. Um, but I don't, I don't see that as a major concern at this time. Um, what I do see as a concern is the issue of human dignity. And that has to do not just with, uh, with human life, but with all life. Now, human life is, is distinct in Islam um, and in, I think, all of the Abrahamic traditions in that humans are um, endowed with souls. And there's a difference between life and soul having a life and having a soul. Certainly a human being, and this is one of the reasons why the majority of, of Islamic schools allow abortion in the, in the very early stages, um, is that although there is life uh, from the beginning, from the moment of conception, that the soul doesn't enter the body, according to Islamic theology, until some time after that. Similarly, the soul leaves the body, um, at a certain time when the body can still have living cells and organs that then can be harvested for other purposes. So there is a distinction between life and the soul. Yet, um, at all times, there has to be uh, respect for um, and a sense of dignity of life itself. And this goes beyond human life. Um, Non-human life, uh, just because it is life, <clears throat> has certain rights once it reaches a certain point. And the point is that of being a, a living thing that has, in the, in the classical terminology, a moist liver. So what does that mean? It means that, that once this, and, and you know, you, a biologist would have to, would have to uh, draw the line here, but there's a certain, there's a certain kind of um, living creature, uh, once it reaches a certain point, becomes endowed with rights. Those rights include to be protected from an unnecessary pain, suffering, um, the right to be prevented from neglect, but also the right to have a social life. So that um, a- even animals who are um, uh, called, who are described as having communities like human communities, as part of their rights are allowed to have a social life or social relation, social identity with others in their, in their animal um, community. Now, this is an issue, obviously, that doesn't uh, affect only synthetic biology. It's, it's about the treatment of animals that in, no matter how they're um, created or, or their origin. But perhaps this, it becomes even more complicated in terms of synthetic biology, because at what point do, do these uh, rights, um, do living things acquire these kind of rights? And I think... Part of what we have to remember is that historically, um, humans have inflicted, people have inflicted social death on, on living things in many different ways. Um, on humans through enslavement, um, on animals through um, uh, maybe the, so the worst kinds of, of factory farming, withdrawing, taking animals completely away from a, a, um, a social setting. And so, at this point, we have to think about that, that social function. Um, and, and this brings me to the final point that um, 
what is particularly important about humans from uh, people in their lives from a religious perspective, I think in all the Abrahamic traditions, is the fact that they um, are, uh, are social creatures and that family is the, is the main, uh, n- that family needs to be preserved, family identity needs to be pre- preserved. Now, what is family? Um, Islam recognizes um, as part of religious freedom that each community should have um, its own laws about what is a lawful family. So what is a lawful family, um, what is lawful procreation within the Muslim community is different than what's lawful procreation in, in other religious communities. But in addition to that, there's a right of each or each person to his or her lineage. It's one of the reasons why classically Islamic law did not allow um, uh, fictional adoption, that you could adopt a child, but the child had a right to know his or her identity. You could not um, uh, pretend to the child or lie to the child that he or she was your biological child. Now that seemed, you know, a number of years ago that seemed cruel, but now that seems, in fact, to accord with what people want, that, that there's a certain desire among people to know their lineage, what will happen if this, if um, synthetic biology advances to the point where um, there is, you know, a greater, um, a greater kind of um, mixing of genetic material to the point that will it be difficult for people to really even identify what their lineage truly is and what is the, what will their s- social identity be then? I think this is an important issue that um, we'll need to think more about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madsen, so much. Dr. Wheeler. In recent decades, under the influence of certain prominent political philosophers, it has become common to argue, or even simply to presuppose, that democracy requires the bracketing of all appeals to religious language or conviction in public debate and deliberation. These are to be eschewed in favor of what are called public reasons alone, reasons that are intelligible and persuasive to persons apart from any particular commitments, traditions, or communities to which they might adhere, even from any highly developed notions of the good to which they might hold. On this view, it seems citizens should aspire to speak a kind of moral Esperanto. (coughs) Our overarching commitment to free speech keeps us from actually constraining other appeals, of course. But in many quarters, it is regarded as something between bad manners and bad political ethics to indulge in them. At the very least, the use of explicitly theological language and civic context makes us uneasy. And indeed, no one who reads the paper can fail to appreciate good reasons for that unease. Nevertheless, the letter which asked the commission to take up synthetic biology for consideration, specifies that you are to consult the views of faith communities, and this panel was presumably convened to further that end. And unless we are prepared to speak in our own voices out of the gathered wisdom of our own traditions, it's hard to see what of distinctive value we can contribute to the conversation. Fortunately, we will not run immediately into an impasse because there are no explicit rules in religious or common traditions um, about synthetic biology, as in fact there are no rules about planes, trains, and automobiles, because the formation of our canons is far older than the creation of those technologies. What there is, though, is a rich body of reflection, observation, and conviction about what sort of thing a human being is, what kind of world we inhabit, and how we can foster its flourishing rather than its devastation. This is not neutral discourse, of course. As a moral philosopher, I would argue that once we go beyond the banalities of kindergarten ethics, everybody be nice, or the empty formalism of good is to be done and evil avoided, there is no such thing as Nietzsche demonstrated in the 19th century, even those moral truisms we commonly take for granted have foundations, and they are contestable. But since that's a larger conversation than my remaining 13 minutes allows for, 
Um, I am just going to offer a few observations that are rooted in explicit Christian theological convictions that may nevertheless prove to be generally illuminating. At the least... Sandra, may I ask you to move the microphone just a little closer? Sure. At the least, they may help those without religious commitments sympathetically to understand the thinking of those who have them. And insofar as they represent insights grounded in millennia of shared and recognizable human experience, they may also help us to avoid moral and practical errors. As we speak of the ethical issues raised by what at least some in this field call the creation of new forms of life, I happily observe that other practitioners dissent, proving that scientists are no more unanimous than theologians, which comforts me. Um, I want to observe that for a theist, creation is a theological term of great weight and profound implications. There is a difference between fabrication from parts, even molecular parts, and what theological tradition has called creation ex nihilo, In the understanding of God as creator, which Christian thought has insisted upon, God is the source not only of life but of matter itself and of time and space as the framework of matter. In classical Christian theology, God is also the very cradle of being, the one who sustains the universe in existence by active attention. Humans are part of this creation, occupying a place within it rather than above it or on some other plane of being. They are creatures whose existence is contingent. However, their place is distinctive. To use the language of Genesis upon which so many generations of thinkers have extrapolated, they are said to be made in the image of God and in that capacity to exercise dominion over the creation they inhabit. This language of dominion has a long and not altogether happy history, having occasionally been used to justify arrogant and destructive, not to mention short-sighted, indifference toward the earth and non-human life. But there is an internal check on such exploitative readings. It is the fact that humans are made in God's image in order that they might exercise a dominion modeled on God's own. And God's dominion is exercised in the establishment of contexts in which life flourishes, proliferates, diversifies, and is nurtured and prized in its own right, not merely instrumentally. The pinnacle of divine creativity on the traditional view is precisely the creation of human beings who are also created gifted with reason and imagination and ingenuity, who are makers in their own right, dazzling in their daring and their cleverness. Art, science, engineering, the whole astonishing human enterprise is evidence of their capacities. And topping them all is the human capacity freely to choose what to do with those abilities. Seen in this way, the vast and growing human powers are at once a divine gift and a sort of test. And the long, sorry evidence of history is that it is a test we often fail, as every form of human power, strength, speed, knowledge, political authority, intelligence, technological prowess from better spears to better rockets, has been turned to do harm as often as to do good. This is not dogma, but observable fact. As an 18th century theologian observed, the human propensity for evil is the only Christian doctrine for which the empirical evidence is overwhelming. (laughs) We may not be sure about redemption, but we're real sure about sin. So... It is fair to say that Christian theological anthropology, its appraisal of what sort of beings we are and what we are capable of, is profoundly ambivalent. And that ambivalence is the richest contribution of Christian thought to moral reflection about science and technology in the realm of synthetic biology as elsewhere. Christian tradition holds that by God's work of creation and redemption, We are made to share some measure of divine wisdom and goodness 
so, to borrow again the language of Genesis, so that we might be fitted to care for and keep the garden of creation. This makes it natural to affirm and delight in all we are and can do, human capacities for analysis and investigation that enable us to figure out how things work, the ingenuity and inventiveness that enable us to use that knowledge to our benefit, the imagination and ability to extrapolate that make innovation possible, and the empathy and nobility of purpose that have turned those capacities to the amelioration of human suffering and the amelioration of environmental degradation, all of these are real and real cause for celebration and for gratitude. The present achievements and incalculable potential of the infant science of synthetic biology is a breathtaking example of all those human abilities. But they are not the whole picture. And insofar as we allow ourselves to stop with these self-characterizations, to think about or to govern our scientific pursuits and their application as if they were the whole truth, we are at best naive and at worst willfully self-deceptive. For alongside them, and just as perennial and undeniable, are the other realities about human beings their familiar capacity to ignore the long-term consequences of their acts, their deeply rooted preferences for themselves in all their calculations of goods and harms, their susceptibility to errors of judgment, to fatigue, to their capacity for self-deception and venality and corruption outright. These are not theological commitments so much as observable facts, and they are observable among scientists as among any other group of human beings. Judging wisely how and to what ends and to whose benefit, new forms of human power conferred by exponentially growing biotechnical skill will require us to look at ourselves with an unblinking gaze and to recognize that scientific knowledge and technical virtuosity are not the same as moral wisdom, nor do they somehow confer goodness. The last aspect of Christian theological anthropology to bring to bear on your ongoing reflection is the inherent sociality of human beings and the social and communal nature of human flourishing. A secular study of human development will tell you that we are born in human bodies but we become human persons, bearers of language and culture and a sense of self only over time and in relation to others. Human survival and well-being is a group undertaking, and we realize our good in connection with others. What Christian tradition contributes here is the conviction that this is not merely a concession to practical necessity, a grudging tolerance for other, the presence and demands of other people constrained by the fact that solitary life is nasty, brutish, and short, as Thomas Hobbes famously put it. Our need for each other is a gift and not merely a regrettable limit, but it is also a form of vulnerability. You all have experience of this, for nothing is more intrinsically collaborative than the life of the academy or the process of research. We learn in advance partly in competition, as we heard about this morning, but also in cooperation and mutual dependence on each other's work. Also, we are harmed by the errors, misjudgments, and outright deceptions of our colleagues. But if human flourishing is social and relational, the nature of human evil is deeply corrosive, destructive of the connections between us in favor of the pursuit of individual or group advantage at others' expense. At its extremes, in the cases of megalomania and sociopathy, it is wildly isolationist, so that the actor becomes the only real person in his or her world, with everyone and everything else reduced to either a tool or an obstacle. Both insights were put succinctly already 1,600 years ago. Nothing is so social by nature or so unsocial by corruption as the human being. 
Separable from their particular and confessional foundations are the fundamental insights about human beings that Christian tradition maintains, many of which have empirical warrants as well. These include insights into their capacities and their vulnerabilities, the reach of their achievements, but also the depth of their failures and the permanent susceptibility to error, misjudgment, and moral failure that they all share. Commitments to the social nature of human progress and well-being point us toward norms of human solidarity, respect for fundamental equality, and particular attention to the vulnerable. Our appreciation for the complex interdependence of life forms and the environments that sustain them point us toward norms of non-instrumental regard for the earth and its creatures. Human power, insofar as it puts those values at risk, confers fiduciary responsibility. It is a kind of entrustment. The greater the potency of the technology, the greater the disparity of power it creates, the more difficulty in entering the ranks of those who exercise such power and can oversee it, the greater the moral burden and the more stringent the demand that our power be not merely power over other beings, human and non-human, but power for them. We cannot think about how to protect and promote the goods we aim at only in the abstract and idealized world of imagination, where science is altogether noble and unselfish, and competition for status and profit and pride of place have no role and exert no force on what we do where human beings and human communities seek only to defend themselves and never unjustly to dominate others. We have to think and plan and decide in the actual world we inhabit among the actual people we know ourselves to be. If we take for granted that humans are fallible, subject to failures of care, if we take seriously that they are capable of sustained self-deception as to their own motives, susceptible to corruption that precedes subtly insidiously, by unrecognized degrees, so that we find ourselves in places we never thought to be, as people we never imagined we might become. If we take this ambivalent anthropology seriously, then many practical things follow. Contributions to ethics as an activity of practical reason. Let me draw some of those quickly and hush. It will appear from all of the above that we will continue to need rules, actual limits on what is permitted, that stand as barriers against the human tendency for overreaching and for overestimating our capacity to control the effects of our technology. At the level of legislation, these can be only quite general, practically self-evident, like don't let the creatures you've made loose on the world before they're ready for it. But legislation is too blunt an instrument and too clumsy to do everything that needs to be done. It makes sense for obvious general aims to be filled out at the regulatory level by levels of biosecurity suited to particular risks in ways analogous to biocontainment requirements that were subscribed to in the use of recombinant DNA technology 35 years ago. Self-regulation will necessarily form the foundation of that apparatus for the science is too potent and too fast-moving to be regulated successfully entirely from without. Self-imposed limits may, as in the example above, be taken up into federal funding and oversight, as well as external surveillance of potentially dual-use research. But, and here's the point, and then I really will hush, the wise use of these powers, like all forms of human power, require other practices beyond rulemaking, oversight, and regulation. For these to be effective, we will also require the inculcation and sustenance of certain attitudes, habits of mind, and dispositions. In short, for our rules to work, we'll require the intentional formation of, a, of character as an indispensable part of scientific education. If we are to take into our hands the capacity to re-engineer living things, to synthesize working copies of organisms or novel ones that will take on life, we will need to cultivate prudence as well as technical op optimism. And if we are even to entertain, as some enthusiasts have, the possibility of re-engineering ourselves and our offspring, we will have to educate affect as well as intellect, cultivate humility as well as ambition, nurture healthy self-distrust as well as self-confidence. Thank you. Dr. Wheeler, thank you very much. In fact, thanks to uh, all three of you. Dan, do you want to start off our conversation with our panelists? 
Well, thanks for three very fine uh, presentations again. We're really blessed on this uh, uh, panel. Uh, I'd, um, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, something about the metaphor of playing God as a way to sort of bring all of the, maybe all of your presentations together. You know, it's been observed that this metaphor is more typically used by uh, you know, secular thinkers, the press, um, and maybe members of uh, faithful members of religious congregations, and never used by theologians. Um, um, uh, and uh, one of our tasks then um, for this commission is, it, is education of the public. Um, so I want to ask all of you, whether in the um, secular or the religious uh, perspective, um, how we can work with that metaphor that's out there um, to educate people, um, not to be um, fearful to the point of totally rejecting everything, every possible good that can come from this, um, but yet to be vigilant about what I take to be, all of you in some ways are saying is the force of that metaphor is to guard against arrogance, against greed, against exploitation, uh, against recklessness as we pursue um, the potentially appropriate and good use of this new power. Um, what suggestions do you, uh, do you have for us? Who wants to be in? <laughs> you put it up, Mark. Uh, by the way, I think it is true that uh, 90% of the people invoke the playing God metaphor do so from a secular or non-religious point of view. I don't know why that is, but it's, it's sociologically interesting. Um, I'm, instead of the uh, allegory of the golden calf, let me use a, a parable of the uh, glowing goldfish. Some years ago, an organism was made with a luminescent gene from a bacteria and was put into a goldfish and sold at pet stores. And uh, I was interested in that because it was the first genetically engineered organism, really. Hmm. And when you went out to find out, well, who did this and how did this thing get on the market, it turned out that nobody knew. All the regulatory agencies said, I don't know, is it ours to worry about? You don't eat it. It's kind of a uh, entertainment thing. And when I was talking about playing around, it was that kind of an example that I was using. I, I think the public in some way says, oh, that's kind of interesting, or if an artist makes themselves glow in the dark with a luminescent gene, um, you get this suggestion that no one's watching the store, anybody can sort of head off in any direction, things get made for uh, fun and amusement with serious technologies. To me, all of that message is wrong. It doesn't reflect the deliberations of you all as you think about synthetic biology. It doesn't reflect the fact that different presidential administrations have thought long and hard about genetic engineering. It doesn't even reflect the fact that in our commercial activities we don't have some license or clearance to say, well, if we're going to use these technologies to make these kinds of critters, at least you should uh, register somewhere. So my point is, on the playing part, I think there have been instances of playing, and I think they are dangerous. And I think that uh, both educating the public about the steps, barriers, uh, reflection that has to take place to release a new technology, accountability for what's being made and where it's going, all of these things, I think, will uh, tamp down the playing part. Last comment on playing God. I think playing God is a, uh, uh, an argument that is tossed up sometimes as an obstruction. It's, it's more an obstructionist argument than it is a serious, let's engage the question whether we should play God kind of argument. And as such, I think that argument needs to be addressed by asking people to cash out what they mean. In other words, <laughs> it's a little bit like the precautionary principle. If I want to invoke playing God, I'd like to hear, and what exactly do you think? Uh, about that metaphor in terms of what you want us to avoid or not do. I can interpret it and maybe interpret it in ways that not every critic would find accommodating, but nonetheless, you have to call the uh, objection on the carpet. It isn't just one that ends a debate, but sometimes it does in, the hand, in certain circles. Ingrid? Yeah, I, I guess at a time when um, uh, a large percentage of Americans believe that Joan of Arc was the wife of Noah, um, we have as much of a problem uh, with religious education as, as we do with uh, science education. So um, 
you know, so there's two sides of it. What's the science, and then and then what do we know about you know what God is and God's power? And I, I think here, um, you know, to some extent, you know, we're, we're helped by the separation between religious and scientific education, but we're also harmed by it um, because. Uh, uh, many Americans have such a superficial understanding of their own religious ethics and theology um, that uh, that they have this, you know, simplistic, cartoonish idea of what of what it means, you know, for God to have power to have a relationship with life. Um, you know, I, to, you know, there's a, there's a beautiful uh, 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 prophetic tradition that that uh, in in my tradition where the Prophet Muhammad said. There is a cure for every disease except death, so seek the remedy. And that really has been the, the impetus for continuing to push um, scientific research and medical research and new medical technologies. But, you know, these teachings, without, without a place to really discuss them, um, that they pass by many ordinary people, and so what they what they have is just this. Vi- as I as I tried to explain at the beginning with the story about you know Muhammad and seeing the cross uh, pollinization of the date palms, there's this visceral kind of icky reaction, right? That this isn't natural, um, and so and so we're left with that. We're left with this unthought, sort of untaught. Um, visceral revulsion to things that that are new and different and seem somehow unnatural to us. So maybe you know the integration of of religious theological ethics more. You know at least the education about religious theological ethics into scientific um, education as well as vice versa will help. Sandra, did you want to? Um, yeah, quickly. Um, let me make a very Protestant comment about playing God. Um, I don't think that the people who throw that term around, at least, all right, there is the press who will do anything to create a controversy because we have shown them that that's what sells papers or brings up TV ratings or whatever. So if we get stupid journalism, it's because that's what we buy. So um, your own doing. But uh, apart from that, um, when people use that language, I don't think they are thinking of something lighthearted at all. They are thinking of the absolute core of evil as Protestant Christianity has understood it, where the um, serpent, who is the wisest of all the creatures, tempts the human couple. What he says is, "Do not. if you eat from this tree, you will be like gods. And blimey, it's the first thing they do, right? And so if you think of the sort of root of human evil is the the striving to be your own god, that that is the nature of what's wrong with the, the chasm between us and, and goodness, then this language invokes the sort of just newest technological dress on the oldest problem in human existence. And so that's what's being played with, and that's why it has the weight it does. Now, um, like Ingrid, I am horrified by not the things my students don't know, but the things they're sure of that aren't so. Um, And I spend a great deal of time, not only in the classroom, but in churches and addressing um, communities of faith in various settings, in in clergy as well as laity. Um, And because I teach bioethics and do things like talk about um, why it might be a good idea to withdraw treatment, which inevitably brings up the aren't you deciding who lives and who dies and doesn't that you know mean that you're playing God. I spend a great deal of time trying to say what we are do is working very hard at how to be human and how to be human in a world where these powers exist, where the knowledge is out there. The smallpox genome can be looked up on your local Internet Explorer anytime you want, And like genies, knowledge does not go back in the bottle all that readily. And so if we're going to live as human beings, as responsible agents um, in a world in which dangerous knowledge is out there and possible, in a world in which medical technology can extend metabolism and respiration and heartbeat and circulation long past the point that it's easy to see how it's a benefit, then in order to take responsibility for what we have done, we have to think together and hard about these. And bumper sticker ethics is not going to cut it. So 
we, we have to, I think, both take the concern seriously and take the underlying recognition that uh, we do overreach, we do overstep, and we are excessively optimistic about ourselves, seriously, at the same time that we say the response is to think well, not to stop thinking. As I invite um, anyone from the audience who, who cares to come to the microphone, uh, you, you have a very specific one? Okay. I have a specific question that I have to say um, has caused me some bewilderment since Craig Venter said it and repeated it and alluded to it, and Art, you alluded to it or said it. And maybe I, I really want to address it to one of our two um, representatives of religious tradition. So here's the specific question. Um, there's a view that, and Art, you t life is special versus the view that you can create life mechanistically. And Craig Venter has said he wants to put the life is special view to death to say that you can create life mechanistically. So here's why I'm bewildered as a philosopher or moral thinker. First, Craig Venter hasn't created life out of non-life. He put together non-living um, parts into a living cell. That's number one. Number two, let's assume somewhere down the road we do create life out of non-life. Um, what that doesn't tell us, that doesn't mean that nothing special happens when you create life out of non-life. It seems to me that's just a logical statement I've just made. We don't know from a scientific perspective, if we do make life out of non-life, that nothing special happens. I want to ask the religious representatives, am I right about that? Uh, I mean, I think logically I'm right about that. Whether you're religious or non-religious, you can't know that. And so from our commission's perspective, I don't see how we can claim that by virtue of what's been done in synthetic biology or even what potentially might be done, we've put to death um, the view that life is special. We've probably um, taken apart the naive life is a kind of impenetrable magic view, which I'm not sorry to bury. The mystery of existence from a Christian theological standpoint is that anything is rather than nothing. That, that there is something rather than nothing. That life is possible. The dynamism and the energy of matter and being itself are taken as an expression of the very vitality of God. Um, and neither wonder nor mystery, it seems to me, are vitiated by the fact that we've figured out the biomechanical and bioelectrical and biochemical mechanisms thereof. So I don't, I don't really take um, that it's done what some of the scientists think it will do or what some religious communities are afraid that yeah. it is done yeah. by sort of stripping life right. of its dignity or its wonder. Can I build on the dignity question? Because I am sure. hoping that Dr. Um, Matson will, will address it. Thank you. So um, you said something that has also likewise made me pause and wonder along the way. You said the respect for life period and, and dignity with respect to life period uh, is something important to consider. And we've also heard both in this talk and in earlier talks about toggle genes and kill genes and things that we can build into organisms to um, you know, prevent them from reproducing and from kind of going, you know, crazy and becoming the blob, things like that. Is there any concern about that from a religious perspective that uh, when we build in mechanisms to end mm -hmm. life that, you know, we, we are not respecting the dignity of life? That question occurred to me as I was listening to the presentations this morning. I was wondering at what point, um, what level of complexity <clears throat> of an organism would I be happy with a built-in kill switch, right. um, you know, a suicidal gene or uh, mechanism within a living creature. And I guess, um, uh, you know, from at this point, what I what I what I know 
uh, in terms of my own ethical tradition and what I feel is that there is a, that um, when I talk about the dignity of life, um, it is that, that living thing that is a creature that has uh, an ability to, you know, and this is going to sound very simplistic to neurologists, <laughs> but something that has a, a creature that has an ability to experience um, pain and suffering. Um, and uh, so how does that, how does that, you know, line form? That's the result of more research. Thank you. Roger. I, I want to pose uh, a, a scenario. So listening to all of these different things, we talk about sanctity of life and the importance and keeping them. So let us say that there is a, an individual who gets uh, infected with uh, some, uh, you know, and uh, that unless you actually intervene, that that person is going to die. And the only way that you could intervene is by the technologies that we have heard this morning, and that would be the creation of a new synthetic organism that would be capable of saving that person's life. So that, that seems like a conundrum to me. How do you deal with those two sets of issues? On the one hand, you would be able to say one argument might be that making synthetic life is not good. On the other hand, we considered human life to be sanct you know, sanctity of human life and want to do everything that we can to be able to save that. How, how, how do theologians think about that? I actually haven't heard any yeah. one um, in the bioethical community or in the theological ethical community that I'm in conversation with offer the premise that the creation of a synthetic right. life form is uh, an, an intrinsic evil, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, which is a sort right. of Catholic buzzword for you don't do it, you know, mm -hmm. do justice, let the heavens fall, these are places you don't go no matter what. No one has mm -hmm. triggered that particular um, mm -hmm. norm, and you would have to develop a pretty extended theological, ethical rationale for doing so, it seems to me. Um, it's there are reasons for caution. There are reasons for concern. There are reasons to invoke what I, like a good Protestant, have done about, you know, <laughs> don't get carried away with yourself. Um, but there's no clear reason that that in itself inherently mm -hmm. constitutes an ethical barrier. Mm -hmm. So I don't find yeah. it a dilemma. Yeah. Others are in the same place there? In fact, that may be sort yeah, of the, the summary right. statement that we have heard today is that there is not an inherent evil yeah. here, but it calls on a, an even higher uh, sense of accountability, responsibility, wisdom, and, and judgment in order, uh, in, in order that it work for benefit. Is that a fair summary statement? Arthur, Ingrid, Sandra, thank you so much for okay. being with us. We'll take a 15-minute